Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brendan Ryan. Welcome to the Country Education Partnership Professional Development Winter Series. This is the second in our winter uh, programs. Today's topic is uh, principal's time uh, and how uh, uh, the, the bleed on principal's time and how we can manage and address the issues related to uh, time management for principals. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Country Education Partnership acknowledges the traditional cu custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. The format of today's program will be similar uh, to our past programs. Uh, we will be recording the program today and that will be available on the CEP website uh, over the next few days. Uh, if you have a question during the course of today's discussion, please include that in the chat section and we'll either answer the question today and if for some reason we cannot follow it up immediately, uh, we'll get back to you at a later date. The session will definitely only be for, for one hour, will be concluded uh, by five o'clock tonight. Um, and before you exit from today's session, please take a few minutes to fill the, our survey that gives us feedback in terms of the development of our uh, programs moving forward. So it's my pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive of the CEP, Mark McClay, who will talk about CEP happenings over recent weeks and then uh, introduce our guests and facilitate today's discussion. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Brendan. Um, just to let everyone know, as I have done in previous weeks, that these sessions have come out of feedback from rural principals across Victoria on what their needs and wants, and even the format of today's session is very much driven by the data that we have received. Um, CP advocates for all rural schools um, across Victoria and has a role nationally as well in rural education. Through that role, I have met two wonderful people uh, from our uh, cousin state uh, across the border in South Australia, who we have today. Um, just before we kick on to them, we have Jane Langley here today, who uh, who has spoken and, and been involved in some CEP work before. And in Victoria, um, with our email system, if there's someone else by the other name, you go by the number two, and Jane Langley is number two. and I was somewhere today and they were raving about a Jane Langley, how brilliant she is at speaking. But it's the other one. It's number one. Jane, there you go. So I've met these two amazing Jane Langleys who we might hear from at some point down the track. Um, so first of all, we might just do the introductions and then uh, then we'll, we'll kick off with, with Adam first. And towards the end of um, today's session around 4.48, we have a team from Amplify Music Education um, to tell us about their program to, to finish off today. But um, as Brenda said, happy to take questions on the, the chat group where we can. Um, Adam, I'm going to pass over to you to introduce yourself uh, first. Sounds good. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Adam Wilson. I'm the principal of uh, Sterling North Primary School. Um, so, yeah, we're over the border in Croate country. Um, and I'm based 300 kilometres north of Adelaide um, in a town called Port Augusta. Well, a town called Sterling North, just out of Port Augusta, which is the crossroads. So if you're travelling pretty much anywhere around Australia, you need to go through our lovely town. Um, there's about 310 students in our school. Um, and uh, generally, it's where, where, where the, the desert meets the sea. So it's a, it's a lovely community to be part of. And I've been here for about nine years, which is great. Um, I've also served on the SAPA board, which Angela will talk about um, SAPA and she's the president at the moment as well. So I'm just going to share my screen. I'm almost the expert at this now. I've done it once before. Um, okay, so can everyone see that? 
that's a thumbs up. Yes. Uh, all right. I've got a thumbs up. So at, your, at the, the CEP presentation last week, I um, heard from principals who spoke about the first 100 days of being a principal and some takeaways that I got from there was take your time, listen to your community, um, be responsive, um, be friendly, be open and warm and welcoming. Um, and it was great to hear from Nick up at Catherine regarding um, his his first 100 days and uh, the other speakers were also fantastic. But um, I've jumped into making sense of a 100 day plan. So I'm going to talk about the 100 day plan. Uh, and I've used this for the for the full nine years of being principal at Sterling North Primary School. And 100 days is exactly one semester. So if you break up your tenure into um, a bunch of semesters, um, then you, you're, you've got something to focus on. But I'm going to refer to, uh, I wonder if I can change, there we go, oops, back one. I'm going to refer to this um, this article, there's, a, there's a, an article that has been written by um, PATH, um, principal, well, sponsored by PATH, which is Principals Australia Research Foundation. And it's currently on the AGPA website as well. And it, the, the, uh, the research paper is called Supporting Primary School Principals to Manage Complexity in Contemporary Education Settings. Sounds quite wordy, but I'm going to get to the nuts of it, which is um, this um, slide here. And it breaks up the role of being a principal. And this was really important to, to the group. Um, I think that when principals look at the first um, first 100 days, they're generally quite overwhelmed um, by what's thrown at them. Not a lot of experience is, is, is known to them and they have to learn on the job. There's no real course that prepares you to be a principal. It's something that you, you live. And, uh, and I was really keen to hear last week people um, speaking about the different levels of being a principal. This is page 13 of that report. Um, it's, it's research from across Australia, all sectors, so government, Catholic and independent um, in all states as well. And I reckon there might have even been some New Zealand principles that, re that were part of the research as well. And if you want to find out more, I'll just do a very quick plug, um, the SAPA podcast. So if you're into podcasts, and most of you are all country people, um, so you love getting in the car and listen to uh, a podcast, then you can tune into the South Australian Primary Principals Association podcast and you can listen to episode 15 where we unpack this actual document. But I'm going to talk about this document now really quickly. Principal role has been broken up into three aspects. The first one is the instructional leadership. So that's the management of the curriculum, um, the ability to get in, in with your hands dirty with the, with the class teachers and work with students and provide feedback to teachers. And generally, that's how principals got their job is because they are generally quite good at this part. The second part is the stuff that we sort of learn on the job, and that's the organisation management. So that's the ability to run a budget, to have enough staff. We don't even want to go down the line of staffing at the moment. I know Victoria is having just as much problems as South Australia. Um, but staffing, um, the admin part component of the role, um, I just sat here before the meeting started signing all of the canteen forms, you know, all of the, 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 the um, uh, purchases and so forth. You know, that's the stuff that you can't get away from. And the last part, and I think there's a lot of work to go with this one, and it's culture and community establishment. And from what I heard from Nick last week, that was something that he would focus on in the first 100 days, and that's just being visible. Being the, the, the person that's almost the centre of the community, especially in small regional areas where people would turn to you for potentially advice or someone that, that represents the school. That's quite a hard and daunting thing, especially for new career principals. So I like the fact that it's broken up into three areas. And as you can imagine, it's not 30% in all three. It's three areas and some areas, sometimes of the year, it's going to, um, the middle one's going to take up a lot more of your time um, and, and other, and obviously, uh, hopefully you can spend as much time as you possibly can on number one. Um, so then you can have work with students and work on student um, outcomes improving. So that, that's a, a general gist. Have a look at the paper. You can find it on the AGPA website, the Australian Government Primary Principals Association website. Um, I think it's on the PATH website as well, and it breaks it up. There's actually more to the paper, but that's all I want to talk about. 
So then it, it brings me now, I'm opening up a bit of a can of worms here. So this is me back in 2015. So feel free not to poke too many fun, too much fun at my plan. But the idea is, is that if you think about um, a plan, you need to go with what you see and what's presented to you at the time. So I came to the school, I had a lot of staff that weren't really enjoying being here. So that meant I needed to do some work around the culture. The grounds hadn't been looked at for a long period of time, so I really needed to work on. So I was really focusing a lot of my energy in number two. If only I had this research paper back in 2015. So you can see my plan here is where I've got some targets and whether or not they're smart or not, I don't poke fun at it. That, that, that isn't the message here I'm, I'm trying to get at. But the, the targets and then what will I do to achieve that? And, it, and I've given myself 100 days to try and do as much as I possibly can. It keeps me focused. It kept me focused on doing the things that I saw was a requirement of the school. And I'm sure that Angela is probably going to talk about how you do that and not burn out as well a little bit later on. Um, and, if, and I'll just go through some of them. So, for example, the first one was around testing. The second one was around data collection and, and holding um, student with disability information online. The next one was grounds. So you can see I probably haven't really tackled some big issues here. The next one was staffing. So that fact is in that second uh, category. And then I've gone with a three year vision. So I'm starting to maybe build a little bit of culture in there. Then six is budget again. Then seven is staff handbook. So a lot of number two is consumed here. I've even got governance as number eight, where I try and collect all the policies together. Number nine was build closer ties with our kindy. Our kindy's on site and we didn't really speak. It was like this imaginary wall that went between the school and the preschool. So that's, I suppose, a bit of the culture. And then we want to review 2015. Now, to be fair, I'd been in the job for not even a year. Okay, so you can rest easy. Don't worry, they get better. So here's my next one. So this is last year. And I haven't color coded it because I'm not as nerdy as I am now. So and and I'm looking at this one going, well, now I'm looking at PLCs and teachers working together. We've got our review of our phonics data, we're looking at a spelling agreement, you can see that I'm starting to focus more on that number one category, because that's what's required for my school at the moment. Maths intervention, staffing obviously is number five and that's going to continue. Governing council is really important. A governing council is like our school council, I think is in Victoria. Um, uh, and then I'm not gonna go into the last two, they're site specific. And then I thought, let's go one even better. And that's this one now where I've got rid of all the other jargon and really just gone, let's just break them up into those three compartments of being a principal. So now I've just gone budget. Let's just get that right for next year. I've got a bit of a problem. We're spending more than what we're bringing in. That ends up working out not very good for a school. So that's why it's number one. Um, it's not a bad thing. It's just it's required at this stage. The next one is leadership. I've got a good leadership team. So how am I going to Im improve their journey as they go on? In terms of pedagogy, how am I going to work on the high impact teaching strategies? See, already you can start to see I'm starting to break up the role into those three areas, but they're things that I'm focusing on for semester one this year. Governance, it's important that we've got a good grounds process, we've got a good finance committee, we've got a canteen that we need a position filled for a canteen spot. And then I've, I've my last one, which doesn't really come under those three headings, and it's around system change, where I've been part of SAPA and also Country Education Reference Group. So I'm going to, I think that's my last slide. I'm going to stop there. So pretty much um, what I'm after is a way to break up the role into three, into three areas, first of all, but also prioritise my time. 100 days is not a very long period of time. If you've got a, where we've got tenures in South Australia, I think in Victoria, once you become a principal, you're a principal there for life. I don't know if that's true or not, or have you got a 10 year tenure? Is it, okay, 10, no, five year tenure, same as us. So imagine breaking up your role into sort of 10 little sprints. That's really what we're doing or what I've been doing. And it's been prioritizing my work and I don't get bogged down by behavior or anything else. It just sort of makes sure that, uh, I'm focused.
hopefully that, that was a bit of a ramble, but hopefully that's uh, something that people can take away as a bit of a guide. In terms of the planning, who cares what it looks like? Um, just have something. And if you can compartmentalise them into those three areas of being um, a principle based on the paper, I think that'll help you. Thank you, Adam. Um, amazing. I, I loved seeing the progression um, from where you were. And it's actually really brave. A lot of people, are, including myself, are probably reluctant to show um, some of your things from the start. Uh, so I thank you for sharing that with you, uh, with us. Um, I certainly remember at university looking at my first year assignments and thinking, how did I ever pass um, with that rubbish that I wrote? Um, we're going to go to, I'll, Angela, I'll just get you to introduce uh, yourself and your role. And I know you've got a new role. I'm not sure when you kick off into that. Yeah, so I'm Angela Falkenberg. I'm currently uh, president of the South Australian Primary Principals Association, and I've been elected as the president of APA, which I will take up formally in July. And currently I'm sort of juggling the two things. But as a principal, um, you know the benefits of juggling. And I did come across a quote by a UK politician from the 30s who said, uh, what's the point of uh, no, yeah, if I can't ride two horses, why am I in this circus? And that's a bit how I'm feeling at the moment. You know, leadership is a circus with all of the joy and the fun that comes with it. Thank you, uh, Angela. So I was really excited about today because I've had the pleasure of um, listening to a large majority of the SAPA podcast. And I think there might be three out of the 15 that have pretty much been the Angela and Adam um, uh, ramble, which is so entertaining. Time goes so quick when you're driving, listening to it. Uh, and I'm always a bit disappointed when it comes to a, an end. And I, I think we're probably going to steal the mailbag idea um, at some point. Or, or um, you know, I, I didn't it. come up with the mailbag <laughs> idea. I'll just say I, I pinched it from previous previous podcast and radio mm. stations. So yeah, that's good. And. Um, I encourage anyone to hop on and listen to the, if you enjoyed the pantomimes years ago, uh, hop on and listen to the mailbag episode because Adam certainly uh, channels his uh, inner primary teacher um, during that segment. So we've got a few questions and Adam, just hop in as well. Uh, they're really open-ended to leading questions and, and feel free anyone else to, to pop up your hand as we go. Um, we've got the number here that we can do that if you've got questions. So. Um, Angela, first one, I've often heard principals say, uh, my door is always open. I've got an open door policy. Um, just wondering if that's an approach you would recommend, or is there a, an alternative way that you would look to frame that focused around this slow bleed on principal time theory? Yeah, look, you know, it's a bit like when your back door's open, you know, anything can come in, you know, how do we provide a filter, keep out the mozzies, keep out the, you know, stray wombat or whatever it is. I often think, why are they at my door? Um, because all behaviour has a purpose. So understanding what's driving it. Is yours the right door to be at? Because sometimes um, there's a check-in or it's a, a habit and you're actually not the person. So then I'd say, you know, what's the role clarity in the workplace? Because if they're telling me about the block drain, I'm not the block drain person, they, they go over there. Um, and if you know the story of the five minute manager about collecting monkeys, that when someone has a monkey on their back and a gripe or a problem, they come into your office. And if you take that monkey from them, you've now got to feed it. And I have worked with leaders who, um, because we're really compassionate, kind people in primary, you know, we're very generous, they want to help. And in the end, we're just exhausted. You know, the dark side of kindness is you give too much of yourself. So I've worked with leaders where, you know, I've been able to tell them that Big W's got 50 kilo bags of monkey food on special because they'll be needing it because I've just heard a whole lot come in the room. You know, your time is as precious as anyone. And I was reflecting when Adam was talking that um, I've led three schools and in each school, I've given them a copy of my job application when I've started there because I, I don't write anything that I won't commit to, but it helps people understand where I'm coming from because I do think there's no second first impression. And, and if you wanna change some, some habits or behaviors, I think the start of the year is a really good time to do it. So if you're gonna have you know, a door, 
a policy where if it's two minutes, have a chat. If it's longer, you're going to make a time. You can do that through the front office where they've got a copy of your paper diary. You could have certain availability times, like mine was 7.45 to late 30 daily in the morning, but it might be when I was walking in the yard, so walk with me. Um, time bound the mood meetings, it could be, you know, 20 minutes. And if sometimes they're at your door because they want to check in because maybe they're a bit vulnerable, um, think about other ways to do it. Can you sit in the staff room, do that at lunchtime and you eat later? Okay, you're not doing both. You're going to give yourself quarantine, uh, quarantine eating time. Think about um, the role of performance and development to do those check-ins. You know, can you do them in the walkthrough? How are you going? You know, um, mirror back to them some of the good stuff you've seen. Um, in performance and development, how do you have those deep conversations with people about career and next steps? And my other one is the, the door is now virtual. Think about who you friend on Facebook or social media. There is a, a term uh, came out of a, a US filmmaker called a tech Shabbat. So she was a Jewish woman, woman who talked about actually not doing tech at least one day a week, like putting it away. And my rules are uh, not on weekends. I don't want emails on weekends and I don't want them after seven at night because I actually can't stop looking at them. So that's about my self-regulation, which we might talk about later. So I think, you know, for some reason, people equate a closed door with a closed leader. And I think you need to um, have the conversation about what your work is and why you actually need some uninterrupted thinking time. And I'm happy to talk a bit more about that, Mark, because um, I'll just give you a bit of, I had it here somewhere, but there's a... Um, Dr. Gloria Mark in, in 2004 did research into workplace sustained focus. And in 2004, it was two and a half minutes that most office people stuck at a task before they shifted. Now it is 47 seconds. So we've created this kind of urgency because we respond constantly. And I think to shut your door in your diary, block out time, which is focus time, and you're going to have to retrain your brain because I bet you none of you are good at sustained focus on tasks anymore. Would I be right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's all of us. We've been trained into this urgency. So my hint is if you shut the door, rebuild that to focus muscle. Yeah. Can I, can I add to that? A Angela, thanks. That, that, that was really good. I, um, I actually shared the paper with some staff members to say, I need some quarantine time so I can do number one and three really well. I need to get number two done. And so that might mean that, you know, just that I can't spend 47 seconds worrying about a budget. It's going to be a little bit longer than that. So therefore, people are going to need to understand that that's it. And I'll just share this is something that I've got on my desk. I don't know if it's going to come back to front, but it's a coffee mug I was given and it's be smart, be quick, be gone. And so they look at that. But on my side, it's don't be a jerk. So, um, yeah, the idea is I'm not, I have to listen to what they're saying, but they kind of have to be a bit quick too because my time's just as precious as theirs. Anyway. Oh, Adam, you've reminded me another strategy. I've had a stand-up desk for 10 years. And one of the things I discovered is that people do not come into your office for long if they have to stand and chat. I've actually worked with the principal who had people who continue to come and sit in and whinge I got up and removed the chairs. That was simple as people, for some reason, don't want to stand there and whinge. So I think, yes, be smart. Part of it is think about how your office is set up and move the chairs. Thank you, both of you. Um, I might just jump to another question that I think relates. Um, in Victoria, they're called school councils. I know you have governing councils um, over there and and when it's working really well and you're on the same track, uh, there can be great partnerships. Um, but just wondering how you address when it's not working so, so effectively. And, um, I think we stem this for me, a principal literally two weeks ago said their council meetings are two and a half hours, um, every, every month. And I just thought, um, well, so just wondering how you go about with your governing councils and for us school council, how do you, what do you do to make sure that partnership works well? Oh, look, I'll, I'll go, you know, sometimes they do that because they've always done it that way. 
you know, it's a social evening, etc. Um, so, you know, think about where you hold them. I, I had one site where we would meet at the hotel, a local pub, and when the meeting was, and ours was like an hour and a half, I'd leave and they could continue to tell their partners at home that they were in a meeting, even if they were just having a, a, a chat. Um, sometimes it's because the, the, they're not clear about the clarity of purpose and the agenda is just a, you know, chuck on whatever. And I think over time, if you can build in them to understand what is operations and governance, then the agenda can be more strategic. Um, you know, how do we give background information to items on the agenda? Are they a discussion or are they information? How do we show the information in other ways? Could be a photo, you know, do a clip. Um, you know, Adam, because you know you, you're really good with a drone. You know, I was thinking, wow, you could just do a, you know, five minute drone of this is what the school looks like at lunchtime. How exciting. Because people want to know stuff, but it shouldn't be a burden on you in the sharing. So think about the relevance, the time bound agenda. You know, if it says five minutes for an item, how do we keep to it? Have a timekeeper. And you know, really critical though is the skilled chairperson. And I don't know that there's always the training that these people can get to build the skill. So it might be you doing it, um, you know, in the background. And I, and then I think, you know, everyone can be guided by a story. And if I could say, look, you know, like being really honest, I'm tired, I don't think I'm productive, I've noticed you're tired. And then I might say, but you know, Adam's school, their meetings are an hour. What if what if the chairpersons could get together and connect about how come his is an hour and, and, and I discover that in his school, if they keep it to an hour, he buys them a drink at the end. I don't know, I'm just saying. So it, it works, what, you know, what, it works, Angela. Yeah. So that's a good strategy, yeah. well done. That's right. Because we all we all do it for some for some reason. Um, and I do think how we might network or share ideas about how to do this well, because I have been a parent on meetings that are boring as batshit, you know, and and many of us don't want to be there. So I think, you know, doing a reboot, but again, I, I reckon the start of next year is you set it out and um, and as Adam had with the plan, but what might you document with people as the goals to be achieved and how can we be efficient in doing it? And before Adam um, jumps in, is there a reason why you use the word operations rather than management? Well, and again, I think it's a clarification if you can say, um, because, well, actually, in a way, they are operations, which I manage. So whatever language you use, I would just say, this is what it means. And I have with a, with a governing council here used a Venn diagram. We actually got post-it notes where they wrote on them all the things they thought were their job and we put them in, we said, oh, you know, like, let's say ground lawn mowing, oh, that's operational. And they might say uniform, oh, that's governance, or, you know, canteen, oh, that's governance. And there was a, quite a bit in the middle that we had to really work through. Um, but in the end, the bulk of the governing council were much more confident, and that can kind of champion the others to move to the light side and away from the dark. Anything yeah. from you there, Adam? Yeah, I well, it actually tells my story, which is why it was on that beautifully colourful uh, 2015 hundred day plan that I had, because we had three hour governing council meetings when I was first here. So, um, and and they weren't pleasant, to be fair. So, um, well, let let's say any three hour meeting is not really pleasant. So, um, it was about setting up a good structure of governance within the school. So, trusting the subcommittees that would that would make the decisions. So governing council were, were exactly that, or school council. They were they, they oversaw the final decision, but in the end, they needed to trust the subcommittees. So we set up a grounds committee that involved the governing council representative and staff members and students, for that matter. We set up an ICT committee. We set up a we've got to have a finance committee, and then so governing council was the ability for all these committees to report back, rather than governing council just go around in circles trying to make every decision for the school. Um, now we're lucky we've got a really good model where each of those committees report back and our governing council goes for about one hour, which is perfect. So um, it works really well. I had to teach some some of the parents though that that we need to trust those subcommittees, that just because you're on governing council doesn't mean you get a say in all those things. We've got representatives at those committees and therefore they get a big say in what happens. That upset a few parents, so they left. So I was happy. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, in that theme of the slow bleed on principal time, we certainly know challenging or tricky um, staffing situations can just totally engulf you mentally and with the actual um, you know, physical amount of time. Just really interested from both of you, what are some tips, tips and um, hints how you might approach to deal with those workforce challenges? In a general sense. Well, Adam, do you want to go or I'll go? You can. You go. You're 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 going great. Going first, which is good. <laughs> um, look, you know, the first thing is you've got to deal with it, because I, you know, there are a whole lot of people in the world who've got behaviours that are unhelpful but have been unchallenged. So, I I quoted in the last podcast, well, one of them, but there were two UK researchers, Thomas and Cross, and they discovered that that 90% of workplace stress was caused by 5% of the people. And everybody goes, oh yeah, I can name them. And so I always said, what stops the other 95% of people from wrapping around those? You know, how is it that these behaviors, which can be really difficult for everybody, go unchallenged? So as a leader, you know, I, I'm no longer in my twenties, you might've noticed, and I've had the pleasure of working with some absolute turds. And I say pleasure because they actually build my skills. You know, that's that's the beautiful thing. They're teachable moments for me. But because we know that, you know, we are hardwired to be with other people, we, you know, we're always going to be working with people unless we're in a one teacher school somewhere, which on some days does sound appealing. So how do we get, how do we, how clear are we about the behaviours that we want to see? So we need to have the skills because this is actually about us. We've got to be able to resolve the problem, not necessarily conflict, but keep the relationship intact. And so it is about what are the behaviours or what are the examples or the case studies that we can take to the person and say, I need to talk to you about X. Um, you know, this is a challenge or, or a problem or it's actually career limiting for the following reasons. And let's find a way, you know, um, to lower um, to work on this um, so we have a solution we can live with. But I want to remind you that you're not alone. Even though you may be a sole leader in a school, you should have access, whether it's through your HR, um, people and culture, your EAP. In South Australia, we have manager assist, which are HR professionals that leaders can go to to role play or explore a complex issue. But sometimes it's around mental health. Sometimes it's around the fact they're, you know, unreasonable. Um, you know, what are the training that you could do? Yes, there's difficult conversations. Um, and one of the things I learned from, you know, over over time is to ask the clarifying questions. Because some, I don't know if you've ever had the people that shoot, shoot something across the bow, they lob something at you and then you're on the defensive and you're, oh, where am I going? Is to simply pause and ask a clarifying question. And do you know who I learned this best from was King Charles, at the time Prince Charles. In an interview, he had said that he listens to conversations and he always takes the last three or four words and mirrors them back. And so when they say, um, oh, you know, look, I, I don't think you're being fair, you know, then it's like, oh, so fair. So what I'm hearing is fairness is important to you. You know, talk a bit about that. You're not so much interested in what they're saying at that point, but you're giving yourself space to come up with a, a better answer. Um, which might also be an exit strategy, and I'll get to that in a minute. So ask the questions, clarify the behaviour you want to see, talk less. We talk too much as leaders. Um, it might be about respectful behaviour in staff meeting that's not meeting agreed norms. Norms are critical to co-construct every year with staff. Um, it might be about the microaggressions they're showing, you know, the lip curl, the eye roll, um, because they're barriers to relationships and barriers to psychologically and culturally safe workplaces. So we put it this way, because when you do that, it is a barrier to a safe workplace. So we need to stop. What could you do instead? Um, and you can express confidence that they can take on new behaviour and learning, because after all, they probably don't ride a horse to work and they probably have a smartphone. There's people who say, oh, I can't do it. And you go, well, actually, I'm seeing examples of how you do. And the really complicated ones, I'm going to reiterate, you're not alone. You should be able to access support for you, but actually maybe they need professional support. Because sometimes our mm, kindness to keep working with them is actually an enabling strategy for them and it doesn't get them to change their behaviour. 
is my thoughts. Adam. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm happy to jump in now. Um, I'm not going to talk about the turds, as Angela calls them. I'm probably <laughs> going to talk about the other ones. And they're the, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an analogy that really isn't gross. So I'm not going to go there. But I, I think one of the things is if you've got those those challenging ones that just that aren't in that 5%, assume positive intent. Assume that they're there because they actually really want to be there and just sometimes they've just had a rough time and your job is to help to coach them to be better. I've had a, I've had a few conversations with principals and uh, it's not that they're sweating the small stuff, but they just aren't assuming positive intent. They're thinking that those people are deliberately being upsetting to everyone else, whereas it just could be a personality trait. It could just be um, the morning they've had a, a misunderstanding there's a variety of reasons of why. So um, I think that with that, it's a matter of coaching. So therefore, build that trust. Practice the conversations, I think, is really important. Write down. Um, I, I, I often go into, into these meetings with a couple of how questions to really um, open up the conversation rather than have a lot of closed questions. So, And I've practiced them beforehand, not always um, to other people, sometimes just to myself. And I think it's really important to debrief with colleagues. And so you've got the Country Education Partnership. What a great association that you can debrief with colleagues. We've got the South Australian Primary Principals Association. You've got the Victorian Primary, uh, Primary Principals Association. So you have got your associations, or it could just be your leadership group. So once you've finished, debrief and go, I think this went well. I think that they understood the message here, and I'm going to follow up. I think one of the worst things in this situation is really doing nothing. If you do nothing, nothing's going to improve. So start those conversations at least. Actually, Adam, you just reminded me of something when you were talking then, um, because while their intent may not to be upset, that is the outcome. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we need to be saying, you know, when you do that, this happens. But I one of the things that leaders can be burdened by is they do all the thinking. Yeah. And I, you know, so again, start of the year, a really key thing for me is developing group norms or a team charter, which guides us, this is how we do it here, and really clear about the grievance procedures that we expect all staff to use, that we actually, you know, take them from the system one, um, but we're clear about the relationship will be intact, you know, problem solving, shared agreement. And so there's a little process that I, you know, will teach people, but then I expect them to use them because sometimes at my door is, you know, Penn who's saying it's not fair, Adam, just blah, blah, blah. And I remind them that, you know, I'm not their mother, um, but if I was and they want me to be it, I'll get a really big gift basket at Mother's Day. And if not, let's re role play a revisit. How do we solve the problem? Because sometimes we, we get just bogged down by other people expressing their frustration rather than them being confident to, to talk it through themselves. So the, the strategy, and, and um, Adam stated it there, he plans. These conversations need to be thoughtful. So I always say think structured, but act, act natural. So in your mind, you've got this thing. And mine is step one, I'm defining the problem and I'm gonna use less words to be really clear. You know, hey, Penn, um, in staff meeting the other day, I noticed you rolled your eyes when Mary spoke. That told me, one, you weren't happy, but B, our agreed norm is respectful behaviour. So talk to me about that. Ask for their perspective. And they said, actually, Angela, I was having a seizure. And that's why my eyes rolled. You know, let, let's hear both sides, because that's what Adam was saying. There's always two perspectives. Then it's about, so what are we going to do? Or they might say, oh, my God, every time Mary speaks about um, recycling, you know, I want to stab myself. And because the, these, these are real things that I've had to deal with. And you go, well, it's a real passion for her. And the reason she's talking about it is we haven't done it right. So how might we, you know, generate solutions so maybe you can help Mary and get in the recycling sorted so that we don't have it at staff meeting, you know, evaluate it and then choose it and seal the agreement. So I've always got this five-step process in my head. What's the problem? Ask them what they're thinking. What are possible solutions? What's possible and we can do? Because, you know, the solution might be that we employ a, you know, dedicated recycler when actually we can't afford that. 
and then agree on what are we going to try and I'll check in with you next week. And then when people come to me and say I'm upset about blah, we role play or we use manager assist or something which builds their capacity because people overestimate what will go wrong and they underestimate their ability to do this well. Yep. So my job is to build their capacity rather than be their mum. Thanks, Angela. Um, we have a lot of small school principals in as part of CP and this just touches on what you both said about how do we actually self-regulate when you are, because it is quite an isolated existence as a principal, yeah. but even more so um, in a small school. And I, I know you touched on, and Adam touched on the ability to pause. Um, it was always an area that I, I think when you're under the pump, you talk quick, you talk fast, um, you talk a lot because you're just thinking of the next thing and that ability to stop and pause. I think when I was best at it, it was often when I was tired or after sports day or or camp when you're in that, that zone or possibly even hung over at times um, is actually when you were best at it. So how, how do you actually monitor yourself when you're in those fairly small situations and, and um, you know, it's a quite lonely existence. You, you've talked about regulating others, but how do you regulate yourself? Go, oh, Angela. Um, so, look, my first teaching was in a two teacher school in the Northern Territory in a remote area. And my colleague and I did not get on for about six months. We, we basically had, you know, passive aggressive and, you know, blah, blah, blah. anyway, we've been best friends ever since. He's my daughter's godfather. We sorted it through. But what that showed me was, you know, that, that urgency, uh, which I think is more evident now. Everything's not urgent. Um, and when you were talking, Mark, I was thinking of the movie Nanny McPhee. And if you've watched it, she had a cane which she would bang on the ground and she'd go, hmm. And um, Seinfeld, he, he made the point um, that a good comedian knows when to pause. And I think that's really true of leaders. So what's your trigger? What's your kind of reminder? Is it your rubber band on your wrist? Is it your cane that you bang? Uh, another principal I worked with would go, hmm, she just do the hmm, which was her way of going, well, this is interesting. So how we we intentionally practice the breathing and our slowing down to give us the pause to respond, not react, because that's the difference. If although anybody do mindfulness, because we talk about the breath is the anchor so we can respond, not react. That's the trick. Um, so I think sometimes shutting your door, particularly if you feel you're quite um, um, hyper-regulated yourself, overstimulated, I mean, to actually give yourself a chance. Um, there are, you know, the benefits of green and biophilia. I hope every one of you can open your window and look out onto green because it's actually shown through research repeated over and over the benefits of green on problem solving. Um, recent research showed you can even have a landscape painting that would deliver the same effects. And it's like a 20% increase in productivity for around about 10 minutes of gazing, just gazing. So I'm at home now and every one of my windows is open to garden. I, I really um, believe in it. So using that, I had a secretary once who I adored. She was an Indian woman and um, she had a code word for me to co-regulate me when I was a bit up. And she'd say, pockets, Angela, I am thinking pockets. And what that meant was to put my hands in my pockets so they weren't around someone's throat because I must have had that look on my face. And what then happened is oh, she'd bring me a cup of tea. So it was a wonderful relationship. I think I'm better now at self-regulating than I was then. Um, we, we, you know, we build these skills. You know, recognising when you're collecting monkeys. You're going, oh, my gosh, someone's just come to me with a problem and I've taken it. <gasps> Damn, how can I do that better next time? How do we, you know, what do we know of your staff strengths or community strengths so that if it's something that's causing you a hassle, who, could, who can you go to for advice or to give it to? Um, understanding if you know the character strengths through the VIA process, if you've ever done them online, I've got all my staff to do them and I understand who might have the strength of fairness or kindness or justice or creativity. Because if I'm struggling with something, I can go and ask them, you know, you've got the strength of kindness. How would you approach this? Um, because the truth is, it's what, you know, 
we're saying is if we can control the attention, we can control our behavior because it gets fragmented and split. Um, another one I think is to, you know, we're always on. So that texture that I mentioned, but having an exit strategy is really clear, it, a good to get you out of a situation before you do maybe lose it. I don't know if you use the phone strategy, right? I have my number in the contacts as another name. And so when I see Mark coming towards me and I'm thinking, oh my God, he's going to ask me about that. I will say, I'll say Siri, call, you know, superintendent. And my phone goes off and I'm like, Mark, that's great. But I just, I'm going to call. So there's a hint for you. Um, <laughs> I have jokingly said to people, you can always, if it's desperate, use the diarrhea defense, like, oh, I've got to go. But if you use it too often, they make you get a healthcare plan and that's a bit awkward. <laughs> So have a way to end a conversation politely, like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I've just realized it's a you know, meeting, walk with me, whatever it takes. And I think the other one around the regulation is to know the pinch points, whether it's report writing, you know, parent teacher interview, sports day, where's the time when you know it's going to be the most frenetic? And how do you plan for that that you get good sleep, good rest, you talk to your staff about it. Um, one principal here has now having all parent teacher interviews in the gym so they're all together which is kind of co-regulated a lot of adult behavior which is good i have paid people to write my annual report for years because nobody reads it so you know it's a compliance document i've got a friend who pays someone to edit school reports so they all they have to do is read them for content not the small bits i have trained kids to be ict hot desk to help with sausage sizzles and train the parents into the routines that matter. Um, and that was because I had an expectation kids would do 10 hours a, a, um, a year of volunteering as part of purpose. You know, because at the heart of this is you have agency. We feel like we have no choice. We do. I think we just have to be better at getting out of the stuff. Um, and my favourite, and I think I know I shared this with you, Adam, was my friend who was a principal of a high school rang an even bigger high school to speak to the deputy and the deputy's executive assistant remember this the deputy's executive assistant said i'm so sorry he just does not have the bandwidth for that at present <laughs> so use that one i do not have the bandwidth thank you for asking thanks Angela. adam we got about one minute so I can, go to um, i'll start. be quick at this one uh, i'll just want to quickly respond to angela the diarrhea that i generally have comes out of my mouth so i can't use that one which is great <laughs> um i have been caught because i live in the regional area when i see the parent is grabbing my phone and is going oh sorry i'm out um, the problem is just seeing that i'm not actually on the call so that, that backfired on me um so i'll have to get that that's hey siri call superintendent i like that one um, I, my my only thing would be there's a couple of things. Uh, overwhelmingly, art large spaces is a soother. So find your soother. For me, it's obviously nature. I love how uh, Angela spoke about that. Have someone that's honest with you. Have that confident that just says, you know, this is what's going wrong. You jumped really quickly, and practice and experience will give you the 24 hour rule. The 24 hour rule is so, so important. If you think that you shouldn't be sending that email or having that conversation, then it means that 24 hours needs to occur. So make sure you practice the 24 hour rule when you're in that moment of heightened stress. Um, I've got a few more, but I know we're short for time and uh, Angela summed it up way better than I could. Um, thank you, Adam and Angela. Um, been absolutely amazing today. And uh, as I, Give one last plug to the SAPO podcast, please. Um, if you enjoy listening to Adam and Angela, um, hop on there. Uh, my long introduction uh, about Ricky, I'm going to cut short. Um, all I can say is there's not enough music in primary schools. I loved the old days when every relief teacher had a guitar over their shoulder or could play the piano. And every time after lunch, he just put music. And that was my music for the year by bringing in brilliant relief teachers to do it because it wasn't my skill set. <laughs> but I want to hear it air amplify over to you, uh, Ricky. You've you've got uh, seven, eight minutes to go for it. Oh, no worries. Um, hey, Mark, thanks so much. Um, thanks for having us on. Great to meet you. And thanks so much to the Country Education Partnership for not just having us on, but all the amazing work you do and support for 
regional schools um, do amazing things. Hello, Angela, fellow South Australian, and uh, hello, Adam, as as well. Congratulations, Angela, on your new role as well. And um, hey, Adam, are you at Stirling North Primary or are you Port Augusta? Because um, being from South Australia, they are very two different, very different. I see. Places. So, so Stirling North is nowhere near the Adelaide Hills. So we're, it's a geography lesson for you, Victorians. So um, there's <laughs> Stol uh, Stirling, which is in the Adelaide Hills. And Stirling North is just a seven kilometre journey from Port Augusta. So is we it? frequently have people coming through Adelaide going, hey, guys, um, we'd like to call in at Stirling North. I said, no worries. I'll see you in three hours time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from South Australia and I didn't even know that. I didn't know there, there was a Stirling go. North. In there we go. Just travel north. Just travel Just travel the country, Ricky, and you'll be able to see it. Okay. So oh, there we go. The home of Mark Rashido. I played a gig once in, in Port Augusta for Chinorama. Yeah. They still do Chinorama out there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, it is it is good. It's a rough town, but you know what? We love it. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, great to see you too. Anyway, um, I'll, uh, I won't hold you up. I know you had a big day. My name is Ricky. Um, and Lewis is also uh, on here as well. Some of you might have met Lewis. Um, so I'm the co-founder of, of Amplify, and um, I have been a music teacher uh, in schools and still am. And from teaching in, in so many amazing schools, I realised that um, when there wasn't a music teacher available to deliver classroom music lessons so that students can meet their outcomes, um, most often it then it just got swept to the side and, and just didn't happen. And I... Um, uh, I have a great appreciation for for the challenges at, at small regional schools, and and one of the things I do realise is how difficult music is to teach in a in a normal mainstream school. Um, but really, how challenging it can be to try and teach um, at small schools where perhaps you don't have the access to staff that have that skill set to bring into a school, um, but also just the general kind of resources and kind of engaging content that's out there um, is well before I started Amplify, I don't really feel like it, it existed um, in a way that really kind of captured um, students' attention. So um, a couple of years ago, we created Amplify Music Education, which is essentially ready-made music lessons designed for a classroom teacher who has absolutely no experience or confidence or has, who basically has never ever taught a music lesson in their life. Um, so then essentially in, empower and give that teacher confidence to be able to teach a music lesson in their classroom so that every child no matter where they're from has the opportunity to, be able to at least the opportunity to be able to meet their music outcomes that are um, that is in the curriculum it's mapped specifically to your state's curriculum um the how it works is essentially 10 lessons by doing all 10 lessons you meet all the curriculum outcomes um there's a complete lesson guide for every lesson um there's a complete scope and sequence we've created an assessment rubric um so pretty pretty much all the works already created. Um, there's we've engaged really awesome and amazing Australian artists to be part of the content. Um, how it works is each lesson starts with an introduction video that features me on the screen that introduces the fundamental music concept to the students, and then following that, there's um, really prescribed activities that the teacher facilitates with the students. So I guess the video is an opportunity for the the students to uh, really engage and understand and be introduced to the concepts, but also an opportunity for the classroom teacher to upskill themselves on the language and um, get an understanding of what that concept is that they're going to be um, demonstrating and, and doing that day in the activity and then following that the, the classroom teacher facilitates a really fun activity uh, so that's essentially the model i was going to try and like actually share my screen quickly to show you the the platform and i'll see if this works um, i might have to ask um cep or coast if you may allow me to um share my screen if that's okay Yep, so you should have access to do that. Um, grant access in system. Okay, let me see. Let's see if this works. Or maybe not. Um, I don't think it's allowed. Hey Lewis, can you share it on your screen? I'll give him the the, the access. Just okay, give cool. me one second. Sorry, I don't think I'm able to either. Yeah, it won't, it won't seem to let me. Okay, that's okay. Yep. So I don't, I don't want to take everyone's time anyway. Um, so it's, uh, we, uh, we rolled it into schools with the platform um, at the start of last year. And so teachers log into the platform and everything is, is there. And um, 
we started with the schools that I was just working in. So it was five schools and grew to 10, then 20. By the end of term one, it was in 50 schools. And the end of the year was in 100 public schools. And now we've just clocked over 221 schools around the country. Um, so it's super exciting. Uh, I just today was filming our special uh, mini modules um, that Eddie Amplify School has access to and um, that looks at key conversations or themes that are happening in school. So we just did one for Harmony um, to celebrate Harmony Day a, a few weeks ago and I just filmed today our NADOC week lesson. Um, last year our NADOC week lesson we made available free for any schools and that featured the band King Stingray and this year um, and today I filmed our new NADOC week content which features uh, an artist, an indigenous, indigenous artist by the name of Royston. He just won the Australian Idol um, competition uh, a couple of months ago. And um, it also features uh, an acknowledgement of country from Jonathan Thurston. So um, they're super fun and super engaging. Um, if you are kind of interested in, in checking out, you know, we'd love to kind of jump on and, and give you a demo of the platform. We can take you through how a teacher would essentially be able to find everything they need, um, deliver a lesson, what it looks like in their classroom. Um, and, um, and I guess to ensure that, you know, like I said, my goal is, <clears throat> is to make sure that every child, not just either, not just children who go to a school where there is music accessible, um, but to make sure every child in every school has access to a, a curriculum based music education. Um, and not just schools that have a really amazing band program that parents can afford to send their kids to piano lessons or guitar lessons. Um, and it's about being really engaging, but being having an opportunity to have like an enriched music education. Um, so that's a really kind of deep level, it's engaging and it's a, it's a real quality um, opportunity for that student to be able to experience in the classroom because, you know, it, it is in our curriculum and, um, and it's in there for a reason that the wonderful kind of positive wellbeing, I guess, platform that it, it creates in our classrooms to, to put students in a position where they're excited to come to school, they're happy to be in the classroom because they're, you know, music is a really great opportunity to have fun in the classroom. When students are feeling great and they're positive and they're having fun, they're in a wonderful, better place to learn. And I've seen that happen firsthand with kids um, being in a really, you know, increasing their happiness and well-being in the classroom and also just improving their attendance to schools. They would like would want to come to school because they know amplifiers on that day. So for me, that's like extremely powerful. And um, that's why I'm a really big kind of passionate advocate of, of music in schools. So what, um, you know, I wanted to create Amplify so it was accessible and teachers didn't have, and schools didn't have to rely on having a budget to bring a music specialist into your school. You can deliver this program with your uh, teachers, your existing staff that are at your school, um, even if they have absolutely no musical knowledge or prior experience in teaching music in the classroom. That's it, everybody. Um, thank you for letting me do that spill. And um, I look forward to seeing you uh, all around at any other conferences I, I may be around at. Thanks so much for your time. And um, if you are interested in checking out the platform, we can organize the free access for you and for your staff. Um, any school that does join up, I do a professional learning session with all the staff to kind of take them through my insights and tips and doing music in the classroom and what the platform looks like as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ricky. Um, Lewis, not sure if you want to pop the link in the chat for everyone. Um, might be great. Just before I hand back to Brendan to finish up, um, next week we have a follow on from our cluster PD online session from first term, but also we hear about the resin program. So if, if anyone across Australia uh, knows a teenager, anyone who's high school who wants some support with their study assignments, anything, it's free. It's a most amazing um, free program I think I've ever come across called resin. I think it's regional education support network. Uh, so we'll hear from them next week. So really excited about, about that. So. Brendan 459, pass back to you. We've done it again. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I also thank uh, Adam and Angela for their presentations today and discussion. Um, I have to make the comment that I think everybody fully understands that technical term, turd. <laughs> uh, Mark's already referred to the fact that we have a, a session on clustering next week. That's, uh, I think, of particular interest to our small schools. And if you go into the chat section, you'll see that the poll has, uh, is available there. So please complete the, uh, the survey before you sign off today. And Lewis has also uh, put the link into the chat section there. So thank you to everybody for your participation today. And hopefully we'll see you again next week. Bye for now.